So, there are a couple of things that I want to discuss about what I do. Um, the first project as uh, JP mentioned is in transportation. Um, the work I did started in about 2003 and it has been going on since. The objective there was that uh, there were lots of major railroad accidents that I am not sure if you all remember those accidents. Um, this is the this is one of the things that happened. So, in South Carolina, there was a crew that. Uh, oh. Oh, so, there was a crew that uh, uh, took a train consisting of uh, cars that had a lot of sulfuric acid. They parked in a siding. Uh, the way this train works is that you pack it in a siding and put the switch back so all the other trains could go. Next morning, a different crew would come and uh, take this train away, basically bring it up here. Um, that one day, what happened was this, this particular um, crew forgot to put the switch back. There was another cargo train that came in the uh, night. They didn't see this train. They drove through and punctured all the sulfuric acid containers. So, what happened was the entire um, area had to be evacuated, soil removed. The original damage estimate was more than a billion dollars. The question is why did it happen? There were no electronics, nothing governing the movement of trains. We would think that there should have been, but there was not. Um, there are trains that are governed by electronics. For example, if you use BART, BART uses an electronic uh, guidance system to run the train, especially under the uh, uh, bay, because it is not humanly possible to control the brakes, not because of anything else. All of the brakes in all the compartments had to be adjusted so quickly, so that the train would not break apart or, or it the back of the train would not go in the front and create an accident. Um, but this could happen or, or this could happen in any train. All of the high speed trains that you have seen, especially TGV, they are all electronically controlled, partly because they cannot be humanly controlled, secondly because of the safety cases that cannot be made anymore. A second accident, someone went and parked a truck in a train in California and the uh, driver did not know that there was a truck in front. Um, so, the basic idea here is that if you have a sufficiently rich enough or dependable um, sensor network on the tracks, you should be able to warn incoming trains and the trains themselves should be able to take this warning and stop. Um, we ask you a question because we all drive cars. How in advance do you think a train should be notified to stop? What is the average distance of stopping a train? Five miles. Five miles. Yes. So, you need to have this signal way in advance, otherwise, the train will go over something. It is more beneficial for a train to run over something rather than to try and have an emergency braking. Okay, so, the idea is that the whole system should be controlled by some control system. And what what is in the control system? There are sensors, there are radios that make signals and the trains have a control system that should stop in time. So, this system, the, the US design is called positive train control. Um, 2008, the government mandated that all uh, major trains, they call class 1, so there is a specific classification of which trains have to have this, should have PTC implemented and running by 2015, August of next year. Uh, various train companies have been trying to march towards that deadline um, and one of the major components of this system is that it needs to be secure in order to be safe. Safety consists of other aspects than uh, security too. Uh, the question is what 
what, what kind of security? It's essentially cyber security. Um, you need to have secure radios. These radios have to be laid out on all of the tracks. There has to be a radio on the train uh, that could directly talk to the engine and the braking system even if the driver does not respond in time. So, uh, the whole system has to be integrated and secure and uh, pa satisfy a fairly stringent set of requirements so that the government could certify that these systems could operate. That is if you look at a train travelling on a track, that is a requirement. The problem is that unlike in most European countries, the trains in this country are privately owned, tracks are privately owned and uh, we have uh, by the Interstate Commerce Act, every rail company has to provide right of way to other people's traffic which means even if you have your own track and your own train system that works wonderfully, it is not going to work on the other person's system unless it is designed to be interoperable and securely interoperable. Uh, so, that is one of the major issues that the US government and the railway companies uh, have been working on and it is still under development. Uh, most of the designs have been approved. Um, the railway industry uses something called type approval um, and uh, are in the process of being installed. Um, so, my work was uh, also to work with this uh, the US government and uh, some companies and to ensure that the uh, protocols that are used to do the signaling and the uh, sensor network signaling to the engine are as secure as possible. Uh, why do I say as secure as possible? Because uh, sometimes you do have to pass signals and danger. does not mean you have an accident, but you try not to have this issue. Um, where has that we're gone today? Well, what has happened now is that the Federal Highway Administration and the car companies are thinking about similar things. So, if you go to the FHA website, you would see that they have two initiatives, one is called V2V and the other one is called V2I. V2I is infrastructure to vehicle, so that they would have their own separate network that would start exchanging information um, and hopefully would prevent accidents or people uh, could avoid congestion and so on. Uh, what does V to V do? You could see a demo of this type of uh, thing where cars talk to each other to prevent accidents. So, uh, there is I think a demo that Volvo created, it is called Volvo Convoy for their trucks to go one behind the other exchanging information. Um, so, the transportation infrastructure based on their various usage scenarios are becoming heavily uh, dependent on um, cyber security, on signaling, on networks and that brings a whole slew of uh, uh, security requirements that in turn lead to safety. Um, just like the, the smart grid initiatives, all these infrastructure initiatives actually do depend uh, on uh, security to ensure the safety. The primary concern is safety, operational safety, but if you are controlled by uh, information systems or control systems that heavily rely on networks and systems. Um, one needs to make a stronger case of cyber security in order to ensure the, in order to show that certain vulnerabilities are not there. Um, this applies to all kinds of other vehicles and I am not going to get into all the details of all the vehicles and how one could uh, exploit the infrastructure or the structure inside the vehicles. 
Um, okay. Five minutes. Okay, so, so to extend the story, there was a train that I think you saw on CNN was rolled over by the tsunami in a different South Asian country. It was traveling when the tsunami came and the, the entire train was rolled off the track. Um, so that's what this type of uh, warning systems do. Uh, they need, they're designed to talk directly to the control system in the vehicle and uh, that's where some of the cyber security concerns are. Okay, so that's uh, one of the projects that I'm doing. Um, let me switch gears and discuss something else that I'm doing. So, uh, which is about the um, privacy and security of healthcare systems. I think all of us go to doctors and we, they use a electronic medical record system. Um, how many of have how many of you have signed a consent form when you went go to the doctor? All of us have. What did you sign? A piece of paper? Did you read the consent form? Most of us don't read that details in that consent form. Do you know that that was actually enforced the way you said you wanted it to be enforced? Most of the time, yes, but have you seen how it's electronically enforced? Not necessarily. Here's a simple use case. We have a lot of people who have DNI, DNR. Like for example, if I'm DNI in DNR, which means do not intubate, do not resuscitate. Um, I faint here, someone calls 911. What do you think they'll do? They, pardon me? They'll intubate me. Okay, so I go to the go to the emergency room in the ambulance. And now will they pull the tube off when they find out that dumb DNI DNA? You can't do that in every state because that is considered murder in some states. So this is one form of consent that if you knew how to specify it and how to enforce it electronically, it actually would avoid a lot of these other problems. Um, it, in, it involves a lot of procedures. It also involves a um, lot of auxiliary legal issues in consent. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, women's health, um, there there different standards or different requirements for who can provide consent legal, when it is legally valid, and it depends on the state. So, for example, uh, if you are considered adult in Oklahoma, you may not be considered an adult in Virginia for certain treatments. Or certain exceptions apply if you're paying or someone else is paying. Um, if it's the health of a minor's child, who can provide consent depends. Um, although we may always not know all the laws, they've been published and they've been updated they always been updated either by the legislature or by appeal court decisions. The healthcare industry keeps changing these laws. We keep signing a piece of paper and providing consent. If the law changed when I gave consent last year, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the valid law today. So, so the, what I am making a case for, and this is something that I work with NIST, 
is that there has to be a standard for specifying consent, updating consent, and an electronic way of enforcing this in, in a standard electronic way of enforcing this in an electronic medical record system. So that there is an accountability as to if the consent was enforced the way it is supposed to be enforced. Um, so, uh, that is another project that I am working on. Am I oh my time or? Um, what else did you make? Okay, please ask me questions. Yes. Okay, the second one. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it's the time zone problem that we dealt with when time zone had to find the location of the time zone, which is going back to the training. Right. The problem with it is because of litigation. How are you dealing with the, the movement of litigation? Is this system going to be on each server, or are you going to have a centralized server so that for states or whatever? I mean, I, I started uh, thinking about this, but yeah. all of a sudden this becomes very complex. Yes, and that is the. Uh, that is correct. Not all states have mutual agreements. Uh, sometimes people cross state lines to get certain kinds of treatments. Um, those ones, I am not sure the legal status, but some states specifically say for certain treatments, if you cross state line, we are going to do X, Y, and Z. We need consent from either your parent or adult parent, uh, all kinds of things. Um, the other aspect of this legal issue is that sometimes there are restraining orders. They are not always made available to the hospital. No one is going to come and say, I have these five restraining orders, so I am not allowed to give consent. That is actually a major problem. And a related problem, if you go to the uh, legislature, is that when the law changes, somebody has to inform these systems. Even if you are regional uh, healthcare systems, like say uh, the hospitals in Virginia, uh, still they need to be informed. This is the day at which consent changes because the law changed today, um, and they ha will have to be an automatic update of these are the people whose consents are still valid, and these are the people whose consents need to be obtained again. Um, so, so there is the uh, gamut of issues that uh, we are dealing with in standardizing consent. The problem is that this is, no, it is easier to write it in English, it is very difficult to analyze that and uh, when you try to make it mechanized, it needs to be specified in a machine understandable way that is easy to update and keep track of how the updates were done, who was informed, who was not informed. Uh, because in, uh, for some, one of the things about consent is that if you do not have consent, they emerge, they in certain cases like emergency procedures, they each state has specified how to proceed. You are not going to hold a patient bleeding and say, I do not have consent, so I am not going to do anything. There is a standard way to do that. For example, two physicians might independently agree within a particular amount of time that in the best interest of the patient, in the absence of con inability to get consent, this is what they would do. Like putting in the tube is one such example. That is their standard operating procedure. 